Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Portnox. In this session, we'll be taking a deep dive into how cloud native, finger, uh, cloud native IoT fingerprinting can uh, deliver device profiling with greater precision, helping to fill some of the visibility and security gaps related to IoT devices. My name is Mike Marvin. I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Portnox. I'll be hosting today's webinar. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Jeremy Morrow, our Vice President of Product Management. Uh, please feel free to post questions in the question tab uh, within your Zoom screen. We'll address them uh, directly throughout, and we'll also do a dedicated Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, just a quick note, um, today's session will be recorded. Every industry is embracing IoT. After all, being the internet of things promises automation, enhanced productivity, 24 seven connectedness and more. But the advantages of IoT are not without risk as we all know, and IT devices are inherently still risk prone, which is something we'll get into a bit more a few slides from, from now. The problem for most organizations is you can't protect against what you can't see. And so most IT teams today are discovering that IoT on their network that, that they didn't know was there. Uh, this is often referred to as shadow IoT. Um, to make matters worse, fewer than half of those teams know when an IoT device presents a security risk. They can't see that, that the device is vulnerable uh, and, and may be at risk of uh, exploitation. And more than half of the IoT devices out there in use are vulnerable to severe attacks. This means there's a major, uh, there's a major security gap that needs to be closed. Uh, and frankly, many of us are unaware of it still. In a report conducted by Palo Alto, it was discovered that some of the most common IoT devices actually have the most security issues and pose the greatest risk to the enterprise. That's due to the fact that devices like IP phones, printers, and cameras actually have very little built-in security when they come off the line from the manufacturer. Printers in particular are used as a common way to move laterally across the network since they often provide publicly accessible print logs. While the security posture of IoT devices makes them easy targets in most cases, the devices are only used as a stepping stone in terms of moving laterally across the network. The same report by Palo Alto saw a large number of network scans, IP scans, port scans, and vulnerability scans on networks attempting to identify other devices and systems uh, as they were searching for other targets so that they could, they could move laterally uh, and penetrate uh, more valuable targets. Not a day goes by when a new headline hits the wire about an IoT related attack. This is no surprise given the ubiquity of IoT. Cyber criminals know these devices represent an easy way in and they exploit that with relative impunity. No company is immune and the stakes are very high. Now as organizations embrace zero trust security models, it's often with limited consideration for IoT. That's partly since there haven't been many sophisticated uh, methods for profiling those device types to date. But if we look at the core tenet of the zero, zero trust model today, the never trust always verify approach, this starts to break down with regards to IoT. If you can't accurately profile IoT, you should never trust it in theory. That means IoT shouldn't be on the network at all. Of course, that's not realistic. It's a needed device uh, that serves a number of different use cases uh, across the enterprise. So how can you mitigate IoT risk? Well, it really begins with uh, gaining better visibility and context when it comes to IoT, understanding what those devices look like, not just their MAC address, but uh, the type of device, the manufacturer, the operating system they're running. You know, what actionable data can you um, extract from this device in order to start to begin to enforce security policies around them based on access and other things. <clears throat> this would allow you to proactively mitigate IoT related risk to your network. Of course, today, 
being able to do this is very challenging. That's because IoT devices are very hard to profile. Accurately determining the device type from a MAC address alone is extremely difficult. And this is what makes ultimately profiling these devices very hard to do. As a result, companies struggle to identify IoT devices connected to their network and ensure the correct policies applied to them. And since it's not possible to install agents on IoT devices for the most part, uh, devices like cameras, IP phones, and printers um, simply can't give back the data about them as it in terms of the device type in order for you to actually take actionable um, approaches to secure their access across the network. Maintaining an accurate and up-to-date list of MAC address, ad addresses is uh, nearly impossible since you don't know anything about the device. And in many cases, the OUI associated with the device is overly broad and relying on that alone can expose the organization to potential security risks, since you're really only looking at the manufacturer of the device, not anything digging into the device in terms of type. So IoT fingerprinting offers hope. Um, what is an IoT fingerprint? Effectively, it's giving you uh, uh, more data on, in terms of the software and hardware in use on the device itself. And it's helping you to identify the device make, model, manufacturer, and operating system. Um, IoT fingerprinting helps you close the gap on IoT device visibility and profiling by providing organizations with critical insight into what types of devices are connecting to their network that is not otherwise easily uh, possible. Establishing the foundation that's necessary for advanced policy enforcement and automation it also helps to pro uh, prohibit users from connecting outdated machines with known vulnerabilities. Um, and it can automatically place an IP security, IP, for example, IP security cameras on the appropriate VLAN or, or insert any other I IoT device for IP security cameras. Um, so it, it enables you to start to begin to develop controls and policies around these devices given more context about them. Today, companies maintain large lists of manually curated MAC addresses of IoT devices, either with a physical inventory or by cross-referencing uh, third-party asset management solutions. Um, this is one of those traditional approaches that, that is somewhat limiting. This requires manually inspecting each device to verify its identity and to obtain its MAC address. Um, alternatively, you know, because this is so difficult to do, Many companies will just allow all MAC addresses matching a manufacturer's OUI onto the network, which again, we've kind of covered is a fairly risk prone approach. So how does Portnox do IoT fingerprinting better? Here's where I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jeremy, our VP of product management, um, take it away. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> How's that? Great question. It's terrifying that everybody would let that somebody would let an entire OUI onto their network without further interrogation. So let's delve into what the, what Portbox does to make uh, IoT fingerprinting better. So we use a multifaceted approach. Um, uh, the first method that we uh, utilize is a method known as MAC address clustering. Uh, MAC address clustering, uh, just for the layperson who's probably not. Uh, intimately familiar with that term is essentially when a, a manufacturer goes to do a production run of a particular make model or device um, that manufacturer is given a list of uh, sequentially ordered mac addresses to be imprinted on the the network interfaces of, of those devices be it the wired or the wireless interface this is very similar to the serial number but is specific to the to the network interface if you know what the first uh, MAC address was in that production run, you know the last MAC address in the production run, you know all the device, all the MAC addresses in between what those make and model of those devices are. And that is a method uh, referred to as a MAC address clustering. Uh, the other method that we utilize is uh, a method referred to as DHCP gleaning. Uh, DHCP gleaning is uh, leverages a uh, um, technology that is uh, embedded in a lot of uh, manufacturers devices to uh, extract information about uh, a given hosts DHCP request um, and then based upon uh, the order 
and the, the DHCP options that were requested in the order in which they were requested, you can uh, have an extremely high degree of uh, uh, probability or confidence that the device is a, a particular type. Um, and when we use those uh, met two methods in combination with one another, you can achieve uh, roughly about a 95% uh, accuracy in profiling. So MAC address clustering, as I stated before, uh, it's much more uh, precise than the OUI. So take, for example, uh, you know, the OUI for HP. So the OUI for HP, HP is 16 million possible uh, unique MAC addresses under it. Uh, and But HP doesn't make just one device. There's no way to know what make model, even what type of device type that might be. Uh, unlike something like maybe the MAC address for access cameras, all they make are cameras. So you kind of know what device type it is. You could say, I want to allow all the access cameras on my network uh, because that's what we standardized for all of our uh, IP security cameras in our environment, and that would be fine. But you couldn't do that with HP because HP makes laptops, uh, they make desktops, they make medical equipment, uh, they make network equipment, they make a whole host and variety of different things in their environment. And you may not want to cast that wide of a net. You may want to only allow those things that you know you have actually in your environment. Um, and so through the method of MAC address clustering, you know, we're able to glean a lot more information uh, about the device than simply uh, the vendor. So this is an example of uh, the laptop I am on right now. Uh, it, and uh, a result from our IoT fingerprinting. So the vendor is uh, Apple, the type is a laptop, and the model is a MacBook Air M1 13 inch from 2020, and the operating system is Mac OS. Uh, the biggest advantage uh, to MAC address clustering is that it can uh, fingerprint devices before they even connect to the network. Uh, uh, Pre-connect simply means that before they're authorized onto the network, before they have an IP address as part of their normal uh, either EAP challenge or if they were doing Mac, if you're doing MAC address bypass before access is actually granted onto the network for that device as part of the radius authentication request uh, we're able to get the MAC address of that device and fingerprint it and that uh, is fairly unique and the other advantage of uh, MAC address clustering is it requires zero on front footprint you're already sending those uh, all the information that is necessary to use this fingerprinting mechanism as part of the normal radius requests that would go on. Again, whether that be heat based or MAC address bypass, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it requires absolutely zero setup or configuration. Uh, and it's applicable to any environment regardless of vendor. And it just, it just works. Um, the second method that we utilize um, is a method referred to early as DHP gleaning. It's built into uh, a variety of different vendors uh, equipment today. Uh, it uses, uh, you may, have, may be familiar with a, uh, a feature of your switches uh, called like DHCP snooping. Uh, it leverages a lot of those types of technologies. And the idea here is, is that when your client connects to the network, be it wired or wireless, the ver generally the very first thing it does is it sends out a DHCP request and says, hey, I need an IP address. From the information contained within that DHCP request packet, we are able to, with a very high degree of accuracy, fingerprint, uh, you know, the make model and device type of that specific device, uh, just based on its DHCP request. Um, and that information is actually captured by the switch or the wireless uh, access pointer controller and sent already today uh, as part of uh, your radius accounting packets, um, if that feature is enabled on your, on your device. So uh, today, we support this for Cisco devices only in the Cisco Catalyst series. Uh, so there's a wide variety of different families of uh, Cisco Catalyst equipment that uh, support this feature today. Uh, and you can turn that on and it will work uh, automatic, automagically for you. Um, we are also later on this month planning to uh, release a SaaS-based DHCP listener that would be agnostic to any and all vendors or essentially you could configure a uh, DHCP helper or a DHCP forwarder, whichever your preference for the term is, um, on a layer three device in your environment and it would and point it to our SaaS based DHCP listener and we can, can, we can fingerprint your devices that way without any 
special features, or if you don't have Cisco Catalyst code in your environments, you'd be able to take advantage of all of the uh, DHCP fingerprinting capabilities that we have available to us through that method instead. Uh, so what does this look like? I intimated on this earlier. So essentially you have your uh, IP connected devices, your cameras, your uh, manufacturing equipment, your copiers, your printers, those types of things. Um, they are connected to NAS devices. NAS devices are generally switches uh, or uh, wireless access points or wireless controllers. Uh, in the case of uh, a MAC address, that would just simply go uh, through to Portnox directly as part of the authentication packet. Uh, in the DHCP fingerprinting, you would request a DHCP uh, address from the DHCP server. That would be captured by the NAS device and forwarded along as part of the radius accounting packets to our cloud service and the, the fingerprinting would occur there. So why two methods? Um, well, MAC address clustering works universally across all vendors and it requires absolutely zero configuration. And it has uh, a lot of merits and a lot of strengths. Um, the MAC addresses, uh, unfortunately, there, there are means and mechanisms by which you can spoof your MAC address. Um, so it's a little less secure. Um, it, um, you may not be able or be willing to, to trust MAC addresses solely in your environment. <clears throat> and so therefore you wanna rely upon some other piece of information. Um, MAC addresses are commonly reused by manufacturer. And this is the reason why when I show you in the, in the product why we have varying uh, confidence scores is because you know you do a production run and uh, assign all these MAC addresses to devices, um, but there's a finite number of MAC addresses in the world. So you, uh, several years from now, you may very well use those same MAC addresses again for a completely different production run of something else entirely. <clears throat> And so you end up with uh, some lower accuracy results in some instances if we're unable to decipher or determine <clears throat> which, which of the two device types it actually is. And uh, modern desktop and mobile operating systems have implemented MAC address randomization. You've seen it on your mobile devices, whether you have an Android or an Apple. Um, it's also been implemented in Windows 10 uh, and Mac OS. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, unfortunately, like it's, on, it's not possible to fingerprint a device uh, who has a, ma a random MAC address. Uh, DHCP gleaming right now, <clears throat> that method is limited only to Cisco Catalyst devices. Um, we will continue to add additional vendor support uh, uh, in the coming months and years ahead. Uh, in the interim though, we have the, uh, the SAS-based DHCP listener that you should be looking forward to in the, in the upcoming, uh, by the end of this month, I hope. and. Um, Additional configuration is, however, necessary on each of the NAS devices if you're going to be using DHCP cleaning. It's a feature of the switch or the wireless controller, so that it has to be uh, enabled and configured on each one of those devices. Uh, for instructions on how to do that for Cisco Catalyst devices, you can find that in the product itself under the help tab. Um, if you were going to use the DHCP listener, um, that would be a single, uh, likely a single entry into your layer three device where you would simply specify the IP address, uh, where to send uh, DHCP requests that the layer three device uh, hears on the wire. And it can be an additional. So if you're already using that to forward along to a DHCP server that's on another subnet, um, that's fine. You can keep those and just add another one. Uh, DHCP spoofing is exceptionally difficult. Um, it is not as anywhere near as uh, easy to do as MAC addresses. Um, and I'm uh, short of basically recompiling DHCPD on Linux, like uh, is not, not, not something you can do uh, with much ease unless you're a developer. Uh, <clears throat> when used in combination with MAC address clustering is how we're able to achieve the uh, roughly 95% uh, accuracy in our fingerprinting technology. So we use these two methods in combination with one another. And because MAC address clustering gives us a really good understanding of what the hardware is, the DHCP gleaming gives us a much better insight into the, the operating system and things that it's running there. And DHCP gleaning is completely unaffected by MAC address randomization. So even if you randomize your MAC address, I can still tell you what operating system you're running and what, type, what uh, device type it is. So why is this better? Um, so I think it, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on like maybe how some of our competitors do 
IoT fingerprinting, some of which you may already be familiar with. Um, the most common methods of um, IoT fingerprinting used in uh, computing solutions generally rely upon things like uh, port scans and map um, and the like. Uh, usually uh, active interrogation of an endpoint or IP address to assess or determine uh, what type of device it is uh, using uh, fingerprints that you as a customer generally tend to be the one who ends up uh, defining. Uh, generally based upon things like what ports are open on that endpoint um, and, and certain signatures that are returned back. And it is generally the customer's responsibility to both create and maintain those fingerprint uh, templates, if you will, um, as new devices come onto your onto your network, um, so that you can properly uh, identify what those are. So, how we're diff different is obviously we're incredibly accurate. We have zero on-prem footprint. All of the active interrogation methods uh, for interrogating an endpoint would be would require some on-prem footprint to do that active interrogation. Of the, of the endpoints. Uh, we're able to pr provide uh, pre-connect device finger, fingerprinting. So before it's ever even allowed onto the network, we're able to identify what type of device it is. Um, we have absolutely no invasive fingerprinting methods, which is great. Um, so you don't have to worry about things like triggering off your IDR, or, uh, EDR software, IDS, IPS, uh, which is very, which is not uncommon when you start running NMAP uh, in mass across uh, your, your network trying to do uh, invasive uh, scans. Uh, all our methods are passive, which also means that they're uh, incredibly scalable and bandwidth friendly. Uh, touched on scalability there. And there's really no maintenance, messy maintenance or overhead. As I mentioned earlier in many of our competing products, uh, where you have to actually create the profiles yourself manually, which basically says like, if this port is listening in this port, and I get the signature back or it returns this value, then then it is a HP printer, blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to do, don't have to do that whatsoever. Uh, we've done all that work for you with in a passive method. So today, Fortnox can, pro can profile 260,000 different IoT device models across 30,000 manufacturers and 27,000 operating systems. I don't know about you, but I could not name 27,000 operating systems. And uh, those databases are being updated and uh, new devices added uh, every single day. So again, you don't have to worry about managing and maintaining that type of uh, database yourself. We do all the hard lifting for you. So what is a what does a fingerprinted device look like inside the product? Um, well, I'll be happy to show you. Maybe. Mike, anybody, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, fantastic, because I can no longer see Zoom. All right, so those familiar with the uh, devices uh, tab in the product? Um, this is essentially what it looks like. You get a list of devices. Um, we're just going to go through a few of these, show you what a few of those look like when they are fingerprinted. So I'm just going to, you know, pick a few Apple examples. So here I have a MacBook Air. Um, I can see that it is classified as a computer. It's vendors Apple, and it is device model of MacBook Air, and it's been detected having Mac OS uh, uh, running on that. Uh, I also picked up my Apple TV. So I'm running this in my in my home environment. So you're going to see a lot of IoT home-based type things uh, because that's that, that's my lab environment I'm working with right now. But here's a, what a Apple TV 4K would look like in 2017. I uh, have my, my, my iPhone 14 Pro, my wife's, my wife's MacBook Pro, et cetera. Uh, going on down here to, I don't know, DNM Holdings. So here I've got a, a Denon receiver. Uh, so this is a, a receiver that's running in my uh, in my home. Uh, I'll go down to uh, here. So I've got some IQ ceiling fans in my in my home. 
Got some ring video doorbells. You can see the type of device type is doorbell, vendor's ring, device model uh, doorbell. Uh, how about some, some Google stuff? So here you can see we got a, a Google Home uh, uh, voice assistant here. Um, we're in the environment, got a bunch of Google screaming uh, Chromecast dongles. Uh, go down here to uh, let's do some Nest stuff. So, got some Nest cameras in my home, in and around my property. I know many of these are not necessarily going to be applicable to your environment, but uh, I don't have the IoT fingerprinting capabilities extend beyond just uh, what you see here uh, demonstrated to you today. But even in your most uh, industrious office, you will probably find a Roku TV in a boardroom or in a conference room or what have you, or even one of their streaming sticks. You can see here, um, even some Samsung televisions. Here we're able to actually get the full-fledged device make model out of that. The Texas Instruments, the, the spotlight camera from Ring. I have a garage door opener here, the chamber one, two garages, three-way TP links, three-way switches, a power strip, all this stuff completely fingerprinted without me having to I having to lift a finger. Literally just auto magically populated in here without any effort of mine. Jeremy, I think that 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 actually segues well for one of the questions we had, which is, is this solution ideally suited for any particular types of the IoT devices, or is it really universal? Uh, it is actually relatively universal. So uh, I've given a lot of home examples because, again, that's the lab that I'm working with. But the database can consist of uh, a wide variety of things, from manufacturing to medical devices, uh, the, the database is, like I said, quite extensive given the, the enormity of things that we're, we're able to, uh, to profile and with new things being added every single day. Um, that's, that's kind of the power of the technology that we're ultimately promoting. Uh, so, another question. Do, 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 yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was just going to say another question off kind of the back of that was do, does Pornox uh, use any active profiling methods or is it merely passive right now? So right now, we will use only passive uh, interrogation methods, meaning we do not do any active polling uh, or probing of an endpoint uh, in order to do our fingerprinting. The dis what you will find is that the as an industry as a whole, uh, active interrogation of endpoints has very diminishing returns. I mean, it's, uh, it, it may have worked fairly well in the past, but it has degraded over time. Um, and, and that is a result of security. So what you're finding is that you were able to interrogate endpoints like laptops and what have you using protocols like WMI, maybe even SNMP or, or other types of RPC or uh, other types of protocols. But the problem is, is that since since those days, you know your uh, your EDR software or even the built-in you know firewall into your operating system prevents any interrogation of those endpoints. I mean, they will not respond to to any of those requests uh, and traffic. The same is actually true, or even more so, of IoT things because security has become such a big problem around IoT devices. What you're finding is that those devices just become complete black boxes. Uh, with the exception of things like printers, where I may need to print directly to a printer, a lot of your IoT devices essentially don't have any listening ports, and they can't really be fingerprinted through conventional uh, interrogation, active probing of the of the endpoint. Um, and that's because they've completely firewalled themselves off, have no listening ports, and usually what they their behavior is is when they boot up or turned on for the first time, they're making outbound calls, usually a RESTful endpoint that they're talking to, uh, maybe in the cloud or somewhere else in the environment, but all communication is outbound rather than inbound. And that provides for greater security on that device, but it makes uh, interrogating that device or profiling it uh, using active, conventional active interrogation uh, essentially impossible. And that's why we, with our, our passive means of uh, fingerprinting, uh, we believe is, is vastly superior to, to active methods. Got it. 
Uh, one final question I, uh, from the group. Um, what package today is this feature available in? So currently the IoT fingerprinting is included in the enterprise package. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say on that right now. Got it. Cool. Well, I believe that uh, concludes it as far as questions, um, as far as I can see. So I think uh, we will wrap up today's I will, session. I will, I, 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 sure. Go ahead. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll toss in one last thing. So there is obviously always the potential possibility that uh, a device cannot be fingerprinted. Here's a perfect example of a device that for some reason or other, most likely as a result in my environment of Mac randomization, but uh, it may, it's conceivably possible that it, we are unable to fingerprint a device. It's extremely rare, but it's certainly possible. Uh, so what we do is we do a lot of affordances for you to basically choose what it is so we have all of our uh, device type uh, categories in here so if you're interested in like what what categories of device types we actually are able to fingerprint the full list is available within the product um, so let's just say this is a, a wearable uh, device model uh, has in the profile but i can type in whatever i want in here uh, so i can do that it help if I click save. Uh, I can pick the operating system. I can pick the. I can enter in an OS version, and then I can click save. And then moving forward, as we start to build policies around that type of information, that information that I have entered in manually uh, will be leveraged and utilized. So that that is all I had, Mike. Do you want to close it up? Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, this was very helpful. Um, as always, we're happy to field questions uh, post-webinar. Uh, you will get an email uh, after the conclusion of this for the recording, um, so you'll have access to that. And uh, you can visit our website at portnox.com to learn more. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you.